Welcome to the Info Wars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. This is what we have in store for you on this June 21st, 2013 edition. Tonight, a voice of reason? Senators introduce a bill to block the U.S. sending Syrian militants arms. But in Florida, the police start acting like TSA. Lift your shirt, shake out your bra. And Alex Jones looks at Superman, Man of Steel versus World War Z. The messages behind the entertainment. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. And welcome back. Top story headline. Senators introduce bill to block U.S. arming Syria militants. Now this is something headed up by Rand Paul, Tom Udell, Chris Murphy, and Mike Lee. In the sea, the legislation was introduced on June 20th. On June 14th, Obama ordered his administration to provide the militants with weapons such as assault rifles, shoulder-fired rocket-propelled grenades, and anti-tank missiles. Now let's just pause right there for a second. This administration is saying that they don't want you, an American citizen, to have things such as assault rifles. I don't like that term, but maybe these are actual real assault rifles, high-capacity, fully automatic rifles that they're willing to give these Syrian rebels, these rebels who we've well-documented uh, decapitate their prisoners, they're raping women, uh, let's see, they're beating up old people in the street, they're recruiting children, having them play with AK-47s and explosives, but that's okay. We'll send assault rifles over there to them to do whatever they choose to do. Some of these guys have actually sworn allegiance to uh, Al-Qaeda, sing songs about Osama bin Laden, and these are the people we're going to send the weapons to, but you in America, you can't have one. And the article goes on to a quote from Rand Paul, and it says, the president's unilateral decision to arm Syrian rebels is incredibly disturbing, considering what little we know about whom we are arming. Okay, Rand, I, I will disagree with you on that one. I think we know exactly who we're arming, especially this administration. We're arming these people who have just done all the atrocities I just mentioned. There's also that video of that guy uh, eating somebody's lung, if you can stomach that. We'll move on to this. Authorities, media, dismiss Michael Hastings' assassination claim. Conspiracy theories about Hastings' death are spreading online, especially after this tweet from WikiLeaks reading Michael Hastings contacted WikiLeaks lawyer Jennifer Robinson just a few hours before he died, saying that the FBI was investigating him. The FBI says oh at God. no time was Hastings ever under investigation, and Los Angeles police won't discuss their investigation. So nobody wants to talk about their investigation. The FBI says we were never targeting this individual. Now, let me give you the background for Hastings if you don't know it. He's a writer. Rolling Stones had a very, um, I guess, controversial report about people such as uh, General McChrystal, actually got it, was credited or, you know, believed to be credited with uh, McChrystal's departure. He uh, exposed McChrystal talking about the administration very badly, and uh, they didn't look too kindly on that. The guy was re replaced with uh, General Petraeus, and now he has some friends, or should I say some enemies in very high places, and he himself, Mr. Hastings, said, I would not be surprised at all if one of these guys took a shot at me. So Mr. Hastings was driving in his car at a very high rate of speed, uh, allegedly crashed into a tree, even though the tree suffered very minimal damage, if at all, and was pronounced dead at the scene. The car burst into flames and the engine flew down the street, literally flew down the street. And they're saying that this is the official story, and they have no idea to, uh, to believe otherwise, uh, even though it's very shady to me that a car that struck a tree head on, had such heavy damage. Yeah, you can see it right there. Look at how much damage it has in the back. Now, it would been one thing if the car wrapped around the tree, but it just allegedly hit the tree straight on, and that's the damage that you have from it. It makes no sense to me why anybody would believe this story. And I'm not saying he or she or this group or that group particularly targeted this guy, but I do believe uh, some foul play was definitely involved. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Mr. Hastings and his family. We're going to switch gears here. This is something I could not believe when I actually read this headline. New Jersey School Board bans hearing impaired girl from using sign language. That, yeah, that's, that's real. New Jersey school officials have threatened a 12-year-old girl hearing impaired to stop using sign language to communicate on the school bus or face a three-day suspension, the girl's parents told ABC News. In a statement released, through the school's district attorney, the Board of Education is insisted it did not violate anyone's rights and it's only trying to protect other students. Protect other students from what? What, what does sign language, I'm gonna make this little symbol right here. I'm glad we have that graphic so people can't take that out of context. But what does sign language have to do with public safety 
or the safety of children on a school bus. The article says that the young girl is hearing impaired. She has difficulty communicating. And we just saw the, uh, the incident yesterday of the, uh, the 11 year old girl who was walking naked down the street was autistic, uh, had communication difficulties herself, and was tased by police. So if, if this girl stops using her sign language and she can't speak, uh, will she be tased by the police? I, I don't understand what possible justification you can have, especially to have your uh, the school's attorney come out and say that they're not violating anybody's rights. Aren't they violating her freedom of speech? I, that's, to me, that's just, if nothing else, her freedom of speech. It's so ridiculous, I can't believe they actually justified this type of behavior. And I definitely think it's some calls need to be made to that school and uh, some people held accountable. We'll move on to this. MSNBC censors NSA whistleblower Russ Tice minutes before interview. Boiling Frog's post broke the news on the NSA's targeting of political candidates, elected officials, federal judges, law firms, and activists, including candidate Barack Obama, revealed by veteran NSA officer Russ Tice. Tice went on the record for the first time with new revelations and names of official culprits involved in the NSA's illegal practices and explained in detail how the National Security Agency targets, sucks in, stores, and analyzes illegally obtained content from the masses in the United States of America. And for more on this, we have the special report from Leanne McAdoo outlining the, uh, these big tech companies' ties to the NSA. Tech companies tied up with the NSA's internet surveillance scandal have released government data requests this week in an effort to maintain user trust when it comes to the handling of their personal information. Combined figures from Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google total about 40,000 requests from law enforcement since December 2012. The most common requests concern fraud, homicides, kidnappings, burglaries, and hoping to prevent a suicide. Noticeably absent are requests concerning national security. That's because a government gag order prevents the tech giants from releasing that information. These figures only represent user data that was provided after being served a warrant or subpoena. It does not represent FISA requests, which is what the NSA uses as part of the PRISM program. According to numbers from the Boundless Informant program, these figures are 100,000 times less than the 3 billion pieces of data it mined from U.S. servers in March alone. According to leaked PRISM slides, the government has direct access to server systems. But one tech CEO said that would be impossible unless the government had breached the servers. Now, Obama referred to the NSA receiving metadata in bulk. He said the bits of information called were telephone numbers, a location, and the duration of the phone call, assuring that there was no names or no content in the database. But if there is no content in the database, then how does the FBI retroactively gain access to the content of your phone calls. It's not a voicemail, it's just a conversation. There's no way they actually can find out what happened, right? Unless she tells them. No, there is a way. We certainly have ways in, in national security investigations to find out exactly what was said in that conversation. Welcome, welcome to America. The, uh, the, all of that stuff is being captured as we speak, whether we know it or like it or not. NSA whistleblower William Binney spoke of an even earlier surveillance tool in a recent interview with Democracy Now! Uh, the narrowest devices that they deployed starting, I think, around 2003 onto the fiber optic networks were capturing the emails and voice over IP, and that was being stored. So that's why you have to build places like uh, Bluffdale in Utah, that's a big storage facility, because they're collecting so much data. The content is really the bulk that needs to be, that they're storing. Now, Binney went on to say that the content collected on the fiber optic lines only represented about 80% of what's on the internet. But by going to the tech company servers, the NSA is able to fill in the holes and get a complete picture of what is actually on the internet. All that data will be stored in the Utah Spy Center, which Binney says will hold up to 500 years worth of all the world's communication. And its main focus will be analysis and code breaking. I'm Leanne McAdoo, and this has been an InfoWars Nightly News Alert. All right, thank you, Leanne, for that report. And I just don't see why people can't draw the lines. And I gave this example, I believe, last week. Think about Xbox. There's a lot of talk about the Xbox, Xbox One coming out. Xbox is made by Microsoft. Microsoft is alleged in the PRISM scandal. And, but they have these things such as the Xbox One that have retina scans, uh, voice recognition software. Uh, they can tell if you're enjoying the game. They can tell how good your heartbeat is going, but nobody thinks that this thing could be used for uh, surveillance purposes. It's just very naive to me to think such a thing. 
Now let's talk about people losing their shirts, quite literally. This article, lift your shirt, shake out your bra, police search. When a lady says no, she means no, except to the police in Lakeland, Florida, where Officer Fetz pulled over a lady on a routine traffic stop and asked her to shake out her bra. Twice. Then he asked her if he could search her car, and she said no. Maybe he really trained at the TSA. Chief Womack issued a statement saying that there would be a full investigation. I'm G. Giornetta with an InfoWars Nightly News Alert. So this woman was pulled over for a busted light, not any type of weapons charge. She wasn't running boatloads of coke. She was pulled over for, for a light. And the guy says, get out your car and lift up your shirt. Basically makes her get naked on the side of the road. And for more on that, we have Gigi Arnetta, who actually made that report. All right, Gigi, so we just saw that clip. Uh, you actually stayed late yesterday to make that because that's such an important piece to you. Tell us, tell us more about it. Well, the, the bottom line is people are being pulled over all the time and uh, really unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. and when I saw this come over the desk yesterday, I just... I was, I couldn't believe it. This woman is wearing a Ninja Turtles t-shirt. Mm -hmm. She's obviously not a terrorist. You know, um, the guy pulled her over because she had a broken taillight. And then the next thing you know, he's asking her to shake out her bra. So he has her like lift her shirt up twice mm -hmm. and then asks her to search the car. And she says no, and he does it anyway. Right. So I I'm not exactly sure why this officer felt so threatened as to uh, what she may be carrying in her bra. You know, I guess, you know, some people may hide drugs or whatever, but she was pulled over for a, for a light out. That's correct, right? Right, and, and she's young and she wasn't, she just, you could just tell by the video she wasn't guilty. You can just tell, you know, and even mm. if she was guilty, he didn't handle it right. But this is happening all the time. This is yes, we have, actually have some more examples of that. If we can get these, get these ready. I want to go to this. Trooper indicted after roadside cavity search of two women. Now, this is something we reported on a little bit ago on InfoWars. This is a situation for our viewers that two women were pulled over. A cavity search was conducted. Why? I'm not exactly sure why they felt the need to subject these women to a cavity search on the side of the road. You can see right there on that image, people are driving by as this is taking place. And the kicker about it was the trooper used the same glove on both women. There's all sorts of problems with this. First of all, it, it happened in Dallas. Uh, it was nighttime, and you can hear the officer over the radio saying to the female cop not to get out of the car until the traffic passed because it wasn't safe anyway. So mm -hmm. they weren't in a safe place to be doing this. Um, and then cavity searches for what? Mm -hmm. It's never in the video. You can see what reason there is right. to do this. And honestly, it was disgusting. This woman went all out, put her hands in places that she should not. It was not... A pat down like the you know well from most cases of the TSA mm -hmm. it was a true cavity search and she used the same gloves on both people for no reason still to this moment we don't know what that was all about but yeah I, I that was always the kicker about it because it never needed to happen in the first place even but if you were to do something like that why would you not change your gloves I, I don't know and then the girl says I was violated to the other cop. You can hear it over his, you know, microphone. I was violated. I've never had anything has happened. I don't know why I got pulled over. I mean, the whole thing. And then he says, well, you know, it's because somebody was smoking in your car. So because somebody was smoking in your car, they have to violate you on the side of the road and view the full public. They feel like they can pull you over. I had an officer in L.A. once. I was with my friends. One of them smoked. Mm -hmm. I let them smoke in my car. And that was one of the comments that they gave me. You let somebody smoke in your car? And I'm thinking, no, this is still the United States of America. If someone wants to smoke in my car, and I said, yes, I don't think there's a problem. Mm. But it seems to be pretty common. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, we got one more here. I want to go to this article. Woman sexually assaulted by Las Vegas marshal judge ignores her cries. Now, Gigi, I believe you saw this, this video as well. Oh. This was a situation, the young lady you see right there on the screen. She goes to child court. Child oh. court. Uh, last time I was in the court courthouse I had to go through a uh, a metal detector just to enter the building but this woman goes to child court and one of the marshals says hey I need to see you outside the lady steps outside I need to pat you down and the lady's like why do you need to pat me down I just need to pat you down and the officer says can you lift up your shirt mm -hmm. she said I do not feel comfortable one bit with that can I have a female officer the guy's not too happy about that takes her back into the courtroom the lady tells the judge judge this man just just asked me to uh, to see my 
private areas, and I'm very unhappy about this. And Marshall says, hey, arrest this woman. She says, what? Yeah, okay, you want to jump and in? Not, tell me, tell not me about it. Not only that, her little daughter, I think she was two, was in the room with her little stuffed animal, and the judge is a female judge, mm -hmm. ignores her, starts playing with her child in front of her, exactly. while this guy goes and, and has another officer start to try to handcuff her, and he says, the only way you're going to get out of this is to sit down here in front of this recorder and retract your statement. Mm -hmm. So she sits down, not wanting to do it. As soon as she sits down, she, she can't... This man and just starts going off. You know, he he. I asked for a female, and anyway, it turns out they arrested her. Mm -hmm. They put her in the clink for a night. Oh yeah. Sent her child to protective services because of this man, and this man is now asking. They put him. I don't know if it's leave or they fired him. I, I believe he was fired. He was fired, but he's asking for his job back, and he's actually suing. Yeah, and the way this lady found out about this, I do encourage everybody to go and watch this video for yourself. But she was contacted by the uh, the news agency who was covering the story who had told her that uh, I guess somebody followed up on this and it got the guy fired. And it, it's a very disturbing situation because you look at this, uh, you're in a courtroom of all places. Yeah, you can see the, the judge right there playing with the daughter. Court. Family court. Family court, nonetheless. Family court. She's arrested by another officer after claiming that the officer violated her, or, you know, asked to see her, uh, her private areas. This was completely ignored, and then the woman's locked up. And you can see the little girl, sir, please don't take my mommy into jail. I mean, I, I was watching this, and I, started, I was starting to tear up. I, I could not believe that they would do this to the kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's awful what they did to the mother, but that poor child will be traumatized with that for the rest of her life. Exactly. And this is all because this man wanted to, you know... He was trying to oogle this woman. Hey, he had you know, no reason. Like I said, when you go to a courthouse, they have security there. You walk through a metal detector, you know, whatever the case may be. And this man felt the need in the courtroom to ask this woman to disrobe or go out in the hall and disrobe, yeah, which well, doesn't make it any better. Well, this happens at the TSA. I've had it happen to me when I go through security I'm, where they want you to take things off. And I'm like, seriously? Mm -hmm. You know, I had a zipper sweater once, and he told me to take it off. And I'm like, sir, I'm not really wearing very much under this. I thought he was kidding. He was an mm -hmm. older guy. And he, he stayed on me, would not let me go through security without taking my sweater off. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being one of those things where I just said, I had people lined up behind me, and I thought, all right, what's happened in Burbank, you know? The guy turned blood red. I had a bustier underneath, and he just, you know what? But, you know, it was kind of like, a, really? People right. were cracking up. It was to the point where, you know, you see people go through the TSA in their swimsuits or their trunks. Just yeah, to, people protest. Just to, uh, yeah, that they, was they, my protest. Yeah. I busted out, and I was I was done with it. That's the second time at Burbank I had problems, though. So there's a first. You had a was there a similar time, situation? The first or? time I went to look, the TSA has all kinds of problems, but I even had them when they searched my my baggage. I'll never forget this. Takes out personal items, mm -hmm. underwear. Okay, and we'll just say he just pulls it out from there. Oh, look at this! And swinging it around. I'm like, he, he really swung it I around. I swear he did. And and people behind me were like, everybody was mortified. It's like, what is he doing? Is he going to do that to my stuff? I mean, you know, that's... Kind of weirdos they have working in places. <laughs> no, but it was Burbank Airport, so if you go through Burbank, just be careful. I'm going to try to avoid yeah. that altogether. Well, Gigi Arnetta, thank you, and uh, I hate to see these, these things happen. I'm glad no. you're covering it. I think we need to do this at least once a week. There's just so many bad cops. There's good cops, but these guys need to be stopped. We need to expose them. All right, thank you, Gigi. All right. Now, we'll get back to the news here. Amendment would give legal status to people displaced by climate change. Okay. The Senate's immigration bill currently recognizes people who come to the U.S. may have no country to return to for a variety of reasons and allows them to come forward and apply for legal status as a stateless person. But one cause for displacement that is overlooked in current law is how climate change has caused people to lose their homes and nationality. Now, let's, let's think about this in context. Okay, so let's say you came here illegally eight years ago, all right? So you're from a place, and during those eight years, you encounter, uh, you encounter immigration, and immigrants say, hey, we got to get you out of this country because you're here illegally. You say, hold on, my homeland was destroyed by a tornado or an earthquake or a hurricane or whatever. Oh, okay, that's perfectly fine. Since you, there's a big disaster where you came from, you can stay here, and that's not a problem. I have a problem with that. Uh, they broke the law in the first place. It, it's my deal. Why do we have laws 
when we reward the people who can break them the best. It's just like, you know, we have a border fence, we have a border patrol, we have immigration. But if you can elude all these things and make it to these places like in California and other places, well, they'll just give you a free driver's license. They'll give you worker permits and whatever else. They'll give you, uh, let you have your babies for free and so forth. And once again, I'm not hateful to anybody. Uh, I don't have this closed door U.S. policy. I believe that we should have ways for people to come here, um, joining the military, naturalization and so forth. But just to award people who can break the laws the best is just completely ridiculous to me. And we're going to talk about somebody in this next report who came from a different place, this being Superman. Yes, Alex Jones has seen the film The Man of Steel, and also he's going to give you the preview of World War Z. So here's the InfoWars breakdown of The Man of Steel and also World War Z. Chris Nolan and David Goyer that brought us the blockbuster Dark Knight trilogy have now put out The Man of Steel. They are throwing in your face the memes that the global elite are actually obsessed with. Genetic engineering, eugenics, world government, terraforming, it's all there. And I'm going to break down the dichotomy between the messages in Superman, the Man of Steel, and World War Z with Brad Pitt. The director and the writers of The Dark Knight, uh, especially in the third installment, put out deep French Revolution Illuminati Jacobin ideology. For someone that has researched this information, it was a very disturbing film uh, and shows that the writers and the director have a deep knowledge of what's going on in secret societies. And that's why it's so shocking to go see The Man of Steel, uh, which is undoubtedly the best comic book adaptation to film I've ever seen, and had about a 98% rating towards pro-liberty. There are very few things that are pro-globalist, anti-human propaganda in the film. Uh, my main criticism is, is it shows the FBI, paramilitary, pointing guns at Lois Lane, interface as if she's a threat and done something wrong and basically uh, kidnapping her. So it does promote the police state. But other than that, from A to Z, this film is a revolution against the goals of the globalist. Another criticism that some students of esoteric knowledge can bring forth is that it is a pro-antichrist film, though I disagree with that view. Uh, you have the God-man who falls from the stars to earth. Uh, he is 33 years old when he's forced to go public to save humanity. In the original 1933 writing, he's clearly a Christ figure. Uh, whose father is named Joseph and whose mother is named Mary. Uh, and the makers of this new film and the writers admit that he is a Christ figure. Uh, but I wouldn't call him an anti-Christ figure because he supports free will and he supports uh, the general humanity. Whereas the true anti-Christ figure, uh, I would say, is more represented by General Zod. General Zod, though, believes that he should control creation and wants to terraform an already living planet to re-engineer it to recreate Krypton here on Earth. Jor-El, Superman's father, represents the archetypal Renaissance figure of renewal or expansion and liberty who is blocked by the Krypton Council and other corrupt forces from trying to save his species. So the film also points out that the ruling elite is stagnant and corrupt and is not infallible and is the greatest threat to humanity. Jarrell also criticizes the genetic engineering of the species into specialized eugenics-based groups instead of allowing natural development of the species. Let me introduce the Paul Revere scale now that we're going to begin using in InfoWars.com movie reviews. The more horses, the more pro-liberty, pro-human empowerment the film is. And on a scale of 1 to 10, I would give Superman, Man of Steel, nine horses. There are literally hundreds of deep archetypal messages in this film. 
And regardless of what you think about it, it is deep on many, many levels. Uh, Superman, and this is a spoiler alert, at the end takes out a Predator drone that is spying on him and explains that it's wrong uh, to violate people's privacy. Uh, there's a lot of pro-liberty messages. Also, as a child, he has x-ray vision, so he sees people's beating hearts, their, their skeletons. And that's a metaphor or an allegory of people that are very in tuned and intelligent who are actually uh, driven mad by how complex reality is. And it's an allegory of the burden of the highly intelligent who are not predatory and who don't decide to use their advanced intelligence to suppress and dominate the rest of humanity. Overall, it's an anti-centralization message. It's an anti-military industrial complex message. It's an anti-eugenics message. It's an anti-stagnant, inbred, monopoly, elite message. The message is we must have a renaissance and reach for the stars. And overall, it is one of the most positive films I've seen in a long time. And it follows a rebellion in Hollywood that I have been basically informed of from multiple high-level sources over the last few years that they're tired of the left-right paradigm, that you're either a liberal, socialist, communist, anti-gun person, or you're allowed to be kind of a neocon, warmonger, conservative. The people are voting with their dollars, voting with their eyes, with what they watch, and we are forcing more and more wholesome messages to come out, like Ed Asner in the movie Up, it's like Oblivion. I'm not even a Tom Cruise fan, but that message is anti-tyranny, anti-technocracy, anti-compartmentalization. And there's more and more of these films coming out, like Elysium, that is absolutely exposing the robotic technocracy. Now let's look at World War Z. I was able to get some of the early scripts about six months ago. We also have the book, which I've read, uh, World War Z. And now they've gone into multiple rewrites and reshoots. So as the film prepares to come out, we are not 100% exactly what's in it. But we do have the earlier versions, and they're very similar to the book, which is an anti-human, pro-elite, pro-mass extermination manifesto that I can only describe as ultra-Hitlerian. They say in the book and in earlier versions of the film that there's nothing worse than American militias and gun owners. And thank God the zombie apocalypse happened because at least it reduced the numbers of humans worldwide and allowed the UN to invade America and put gun owners and families in concentration camps. They praise communism in the book and in the earlier screenplays. It is a piece of authoritarian pornography. And despite the fact it has a mega budget and Brad Pitt is behind it, I predict this film will not perform as good as other films that have more wholesome messages. People are sick of the psychic poison. The globalists want to turn off our life force, turn off our self-preservation instinct. They want to teach us it's sexy and cool to be anti-human. And in the book and the earlier screenplays, they talk about how being cold-blooded and exterminating masses of people and feeding families to the zombies was the smart thing to do. And how the United Nations used the crisis to bring in their global government and finally crush right-wing libertarians in America. And then you look at the big megabanks that control the world and are setting up global taxation and who are above the law and exempt through the UN and have diplomatic immunity. This is what they're promoting. There's going to be a worldwide biological release that reduces world population and that the UN will manage the globe during this crisis. This is all basically a Jim Jones Kool-Aid drinking drill. Jim Jones had his followers in Guyana hundreds of times drill drinking the Kool-Aid until finally they put the cyanide in it and everybody poisoned themselves. And that's what this is. Just get ready for major collapse. And those of you that work for the technocracy, who are specialists, like the Brad Pitt character, you'll get to go be on the ships safe from the bioweapon release. You'll get to go to the underground bases during the mass calamity and collapse that is coming. And then I researched their underground seed banks, their martial law plans. They're actually gearing up for something like this. 
And they've got all these scientists and top police and military signed on to believing they're going to be protected during all this. I have not seen it yet. It's coming out tomorrow. But I've read the book, seen the early screenplays. I would have to give it zero Paul Revere's as an anti-human treatise. Uh, shelling the zombies uh, as the liberators of humanity, shelling the image of humanity as a bunch of walking dead. Thoroughly disgusting. So I give World War Z zero Paul Revere's. So World War Z is a dress rehearsal for worldwide planetary genocide and a re-engineering of our planet. They're selling General Zod's takeover as a good thing in World War Z. And so that's why I hope that World War Z is a failure and that positive films like Oblivion and Man of Steel and Up and so many others become the norm because there's a fight for the heart and soul of Hollywood right now. And regardless of what you think about Hollywood, it is the worldwide propaganda channel of the globalist. And you're seeing a spiritual fight, a cultural fight for the future of humanity taking place right now. I'm Alex Jones with InfoWars.com. This is another film review. Superman, the Man of Steel versus World War Z, only at InfoWars.com. And as Alex said in that video, we're going to start doing more of these reviews. And we've also done some in the past. Uh, I've done some. Alex has done some, as well as other people. And, uh, you know, people ask, like, why do you guys promote these movies and so so forth and video games and all that we're not necessarily promoting things yeah alex said that was a pretty good movie and i do agree superman was a good movie i had a chance to see it myself but when we talk about these video games especially when i talk about them i'm trying to expose the propaganda therein you know like we had in the last uh rainbow six patriots saying that people who are concerned about their government people concerned about these banker bailouts you know they're wicked terrorists who want to kill you and skin you like a bug basically that's what was in the trailer and they and the good guys shoot the police and throw uh, hostages off of bridges and so forth and that's the american way uh so that's why we like to do these things just to uh, get people alert to this these kind of things if you don't care about the video games and don't buy it or whatever but uh, we just want people to be aware that these propaganda things are in these pieces we'll move on to our last article of the night fbi received an aviation clearance for at least four domestic drone operations the documents provide virtually no detail on where the FBI operated drones in U.S. airspace, for what purpose, or for how long the missions lasted. But they shed some additional light on the origins and extent of the FBI's secretive drone program. Now, let's think about this. Uh, Mueller, the FBI director, is saying, you know, we had a few drones, but it's not a big deal, and you guys shouldn't really care about it. And he goes and say, like, very few drones and it had a very f small footprint in a very minimal way and all this stuff, just, just trying to completely minimize it, completely ignoring the fact that this wasn't supposed to be going on anyway, and they also denied it. The U.S. has for a very long time saying that they never used drones domestically, even though we have documented well before the, the FBI got around to admitting it, how they're using drones on U.S. Canada border, U.S. Mexico border, and then also uh, police are getting uh, the smaller drones, not the big predators, but you know the smaller things that you can go buy at a retail store. And people say, well, you can go buy it at a retail store. What's the big deal? You can attach cameras to these things. Some of these things have cameras built into them. And yes, these things could be good used for good uh, resources, such as uh, finding lost people and so forth. But a lot of these things are used to spy on people. And even the smaller drones that you can go buy at an electronic store, you can fit a gun to it. You can go to YouTube right now, type in people with, you know, attaching guns to drones. And people you do it. You know, FBS Russia has one. I mean, these things do exist. These things can be made. So just keep that in mind next time you say, well, it's only a small drone. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. All right, so that's the end of our news broadcast. We'll go now to our quote of the day. This by Carl Jung. In all chaos, there is a cosmos. In all disorder, a secret order. And that's our quote of the day. Now stay tuned. After this break, we'll be right back with Dan Badandi. He's going to be interviewing veterans about Monsanto. I'm sure that's going to be very interesting. But in the meantime, before we get to the break, if you like this broadcast and you'd like to see it continue, especially if you're watching this on YouTube, consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. It's our resource. We can go and see the nightly news, the Alex Jones show, the rants, all that is right there on PrisonPlanet.tv. And also check out the InfoWars shop. Pick up State of Mind. You can get it also on Blu-ray as well as DVD. And it comes with a free American Dream. That's a great film all by itself. But this is only $19.95 for, uh, for the DVD, 5 bucks more for the Blu-ray. So check those both out. Alex is in uh, State of Mind. And also check out 
uh, The American Dream, both great films at InfoWars Shop. So that's it for this, and stay tuned for Dan Badandi. Now you can watch the InfoWars Nightly News streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show. Johnny Appleseed was born during the Revolutionary War. He's not just a legend. And in more than five states, he introduced apples that had not even been grown in the colonies. Later, the seeds from plants he planted and cultivated and some of the varieties he developed spread across the United States. And it was Johnny Appleseed teaching the colonists and then the New Americans after we won independence the love of planting fruit trees that introduced that idea to North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Become the Johnny Appleseed of your community with seeds from the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsStore.com. The simple act of planting fruits and vegetables and then tending them and taking care of them and then sharing them with friends and family is a revolutionary act against tyranny. The globalists, first and foremost, do not want us to be self-sufficient. The crony anti-free market capitalist, the fascist, are using socialism and collectivism to shut down societies. Stalin in Poland and in Ukraine and other areas starved on record more than 10 million people over five years by not letting them grow their own crops and collectivizing them. Mao killed between 65 million and 80 plus million people doing this same thing. The UN says they will use food as a weapon. They use genetic evil to attack the earth and major GMO companies have been caught going into growth belts around the world, even where GMO is illegal, and planting seeds everywhere to infect the genetics of the original crops. Almost all of the thousands of varieties of Mexican corn has been infected. They are in a genetic war against everyone. That's why we have to get these seeds and not just plant them on our own gardens and not just give them as gifts to friends and family to plant spring and summer and fall gardens. I'm calling on you to go out into the green belts, to go out into the areas and plant secret gardens. No, not of marijuana, but of the hundreds and hundreds of incredible high quality uh, vegetables and herbs and fruit plants that are here. Lemons and oranges, the list goes on and on. They will grow, uh, plum trees, grape trees, they will grow almost everywhere in the U.S. We can literally, not just buying these products from InfoWarsStore.com, but from wherever you get them. This aggressive program literally just came to me one morning when I woke up about 4 a.m. realizing that we've got to counter their genetic war against us with original real crops developed over eons on this planet. We have the lowest prices we bought it in the biggest bulk that some of these companies have ever seen to ship this directly to you from the InfoWars Command Center. We stand for life. We stand for liberty. We stand for self-sufficiency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com, click on the Seed Center, and as of taping this, we have the seven top respected brands. We intend to continue to do research and find other companies, other specialties, other varieties to really take action. The InfoWars Store Seed Center has the largest online selection of heirloom, non-GMO seeds. Check out these products from our newest supplier, Heirloom Organics. The Medicine Garden for a natural remedy. The Tea Garden that contains every important tea herb you can grow. Fruit Lovers with 12 varieties. And the Tobacco Pack, additive and pesticide free. Join the gardening revolution today at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a revolutionary action we're asking you to take. Plant seeds everywhere today. Nurture them, bring them to fruit, and pass on the knowledge to others. Become human again. Discover your roots in the soil. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. <laughs>
This is Dan Bedondi reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. And today we're going to have a special report about Monsanto in Fort McClellan, Alabama. From 1935 to 1999, when Fort McClellan was open, hundreds of thousands of our troops got poisoned and radiated by Monsanto. And today we're going to interview several people that are going to give their testimony of what happened at Fort McClellan. Hi, my name's Sal Cayozo. I served at Fort McClellan, Alabama in 1981 for basic training as well as AIT for military police training. Uh, I am currently spearheading in Rhode Island the, um, the fact of HR 411, which is a Health Registry Act, which is in Congress and has been in Congress three prior times and never made it. Hi, my name's Dennis Trembley. I served with the uh, 43rd Military Police Brigade, 119th MP Company. Um, I was stationed in Fort McClellan, Alabama for uh, United States Army Military Police Training. Uh, 95 Bravo was the uh, MOS. Well, I guess in the 1960s, 1970, Monsanto had a, a factory on the outside gate, in one of the gates. And uh, basically what had happened was they had PCB leaks that polluted the whole area. Now, we all know PCBs stay in the ground. They just don't go away. Uh, as far as radiation, there was a lot of testing done at Pelham Range with depleted uranium. Um, depleted uranium is a funny thing because it is alpha particles. However, when it does get hot, it turns into an aerosol and you breathe it in. Alpha particles become very dangerous to you then. Uh, other things as well were PCBs in the water, as well as TCEs. And at one of the, at the MP training site, there was ionizing radiation found, which was cobalt and plutonium. How I found this out was I was actually Googling, uh, I was trying to look up old pictures of the post and show my kids about, I wanted to see what, what kind of advancements in training and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I was very unaware. I, I did not know about the toxic exposure, the contamination. When I basically turned 40, I started to really feel different and started to get sick. Uh, I have intestinal issues, which the doctors gave a name of it as IBS, basically because they don't know what's wrong. I suffer from chronic joint pain. Um, I've had my gallbladder removed when I was 28 years old, uh, kind of young to have that removed. Uh, a number of other things too, um, I ended up with fibromyalgia and the doctors can't explain that either. I mean, it's every time I go to a doctor, they just scratch their head. I mean, I, I'm a type, type 2 diabetic, uh, thyroid problems, hypertension, I've had polyps removed out of my stomach uh, two, on two separate occasions. I, I have a difficult time sometimes breathing. Uh, my stomach gets rock hard and my chest feels like I have an elephant sitting on it. They once brought me into the hospital by ambulance. They kept me in the hospital to do a cardiac workup. Heart's fine. Everything mimicked a heart attack. Heart's fine. I've been sick and actually went to uh, Kent County Hospital back just a few years ago and I actually had the head of the ER department tell me that my body was septic and toxic and they did not know what was making me sick. My son at six years old ended up with a Ewing sarcoma uh, to the jaw. It's a type of bone cancer. It's a very rare bone cancer on short bones. Usually you get it on the long bones like the ulna, the fibula, these type of things. Um, the doctors at Mass General, because that's where I brought him, actually said that it was very rare for a child to have that type of cancer in the jaw. Fortunately, we saved him. He's 24 years old now, but however, he still needs to go through all sorts of surgeries and everything else. I mean, it's been very taxing on the family. And of course, when I got sick, I lost everything. There was nowhere I could go and say, hey, I'm having a problem. It's, they don't care. I, I, the only thing I can say is just absolute, complete betrayal. Like, betrayal, depression, um, you know what I mean? F finding, I, I, I'm still in the process of finding stuff out. Like this story is so deep that it's, I, I mean, just Google, Google Fort McClellan toxic exposure 
and get in touch with us on the Facebook groups and everything is right there for you to see. H.R. 411 is a bill by, brought out by uh, Congressman Tonko in the Albany District of New York State. Um, this bill basically is a health registry act. It's basically to notify all the veterans that serve there and to let them know, you know, hey, we, we have a health registry. What's wrong with you? What's going on? What's not going on? It's gone through three other sessions of Congress with different numbers. Another one, I believe, was 2036, the last one. It never goes through. In fact, H.R. 1960, the beloved NDAA Act that just got voted on this past Friday, Congressman Tonko tried to put an amendment, Amendment 83, which was to the Secretary of the Army to notify everyone that was stationed at Fort McClellan about what's going on, about the possibilities, as they wrote, of contamination there. According to Tonko's office this morning, which I called them because I am a, a Rhode Island lobbyist, um, and they did talk to me, they struck it. They didn't even want to hear it. VA covers absolutely 100% nothing. They deny everything. Uh, it's up to you to prove your own case, so to speak. Yep. And I mean, we, there's EPA reports. There's, you know, radiological society reports. There, there's anything you need. You you can Google and you can see actual yeah. report, factual reports. This isn't just hearsay. I found out because I saw an article in law enforcement today last year. I was going through my whole life saying, well, geez, what's wrong with me? And you said there's EPA reports on this too? There's also EPA reports. There's also ADEM reports, which is the Alabama Department of Environmental Management reports. There are also private company links that they had people go in. There's also one report from 1966 that a biologist went there, put bluegill fishes in one of the streams. And within three minutes, their eyes popped out, they were dead, their, their skin came off as they were boiled. One thing I want everybody to understand is that, like, there was, you know, in World War II, there was over 500,000 people that went through this base. That's just World War II. That ain't any other conflict. I mean, the, the vast majority, you know, a lot of these people could be, could be dead right now. There's still stuff there. It's leaching out of the ground. People got sick. And lest us not forget that Monsanto paid the town of Anniston, or the city of Anniston, $700 million, to which not one veteran, not one veteran was informed. We were kept out of it thinking that the United States government would take their responsibility, and at the end of the day, we see that they're going to be childish. When I went, I went in uh, November of 96 till May of 97, and they knew about it back then. The EPA reports will show that. You can yep. Google it. They knew when I went in 96. They were already scheduled for, uh, you know, everything that was to come up. So I thought it was just maybe the U.S. Army chemical soldiers that this, was, this affected, but it affected anybody and everybody from 1935 to 1999. If you served any amount of time at this base whatsoever and, and you're experiencing any health problems whatsoever, you need to go and get checked out and you need to file a claim for toxic exposure. Their best bet would be to go to poisonveterans.org. Um, that would be a good place to start. They can turn around and they can communicate to me. I'm actually the one who started this thing. Um, that would be the first place. The second place, there are Facebook pages and stuff like that, Facebook groups that people can join that were there to, uh, you know, to talk to everyone else to see, you know, get everybody else's handle on this. Um, and the only other thing I can think of is just get in touch with their congressman and stop banging on doors and do whatever. I mean, if we don't do this, we're screwed. You know, fr from here, it's going to, you know, I, I've been told it's only going to get worse, and I, I'm seeing it's getting worse, but I ain't going to stop. I'm, I'm going to follow Sal to hell, if need be, to get this resolution passed for everybody that this has affected. 
Well, from here, my plans are to get a lot of other people involved in their own states so they can get the same resolutions done from their own states and send them to Washington. At least that way Washington knows that the state levels know, because you know as well as I do, if Washington does nothing, this is going to be kept on the state levels, and people are going to be on a state dime for insurance, welfare, or what have you, because a lot of us are sick and the, the government needs to take responsibility. Please get this message across the American people that we're, we're sick, we're dying, we were poisoned against our will, using, used as human lab rats, and, you know, this is completely unfair. We were betrayed. I mean, you know, we, we, any one of us, and I can speak for, for a multitude of veterans, any one of us would have laid down our life f for the greatness of this country and for the freedoms that it provides and, you know, Please just don't forget us. I love my country. I love its people. I fear my government. I have no trust in my government. I believe that this whole thing is a facade. You know, something phony to keep people happy and that's it. But when push comes to shove, forget it. They're going to put you under the rug. You just witnessed disturbing testimonies from actual soldiers who served and trained, or should I say victims, at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And it's very disturbing to know that you put your heart and soul to go serve your country proudly, but later to learn that your enemies are not just foreign and domestic, but through your own government. These guys have been heavily toxified, no compensation, no help, no, no knowledge from our own government. And what we could do as people, as civilians, as fellow soldiers, is to help H.R. 411 pass, push this bill through, and get these soldiers the compensation and recognition that they rightfully deserve. And this is Dan Bedondi reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.